Good evening and welcome to APTN News Weekend. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Family of a deceased young woman from St. Catharines, Ontario, is hoping to see change in how hospitals treat Indigenous people. APTN's Annette Francis recently sat down with the 24-year-old's mother to talk about what happened and what should change. Here's that story. This is actually my favorite picture because it's me and Heather and um, um, underneath this uh, thing here it says, my mom is pretty. It's nice that she thought of me that way. I like that. All the diagnostics. This collage holds some special photos and memories for Francine Shimizu. Um, she had a really good sense of humor. And she always put things into perspective for me in a, in a very funny kind of way. Her 24-year-old daughter, Heather Winterstein, died last December at the St. Catharines General Hospital. Shimizu, who is a nurse, is still grieving her loss, which she says started with a staph infection. Well, she ended up picking up a bug, uh, a couple of bugs, group strep A and Staphylococcus aureus. So if it, it penetrates the skin, then it can get into... Um, other parts and um, people can get very sick very fast so diagnosis is important she says her daughter was prescribed Tylenol and sent home on a city bus uh, when her her dad who's a truck driver he came home at 2 in the morning and she was moaning in pain in her bed uh, he helped her get comfortable, and finally he decided to call, a, call the ambulance and have her return to the hospital. And um, um, unfortunately, the hospital triage put her in the waiting area, and she was there from about 12.30 till the time that she passed out and fell out of her wheelchair, and, um, and then she passed away at 8.40 in the evening. But Heather's family isn't going to let her death just slip by. They've called for an investigation into emergency services and a coroner's inquest. Shimizu's also hoping to create a new law. Heather's law ensures that there's access to health care for Aboriginal people, uh, marginalized individuals, um, in particular people who are dealing with addictions. Um, it's to ensure that they get equal access to health care um, just the same as um, a non-Aboriginal or a non-marginalized individual. They're not alone in their call for justice. Six nations of the Grand River released this statement. Six nations of the Grand River Elected Council condemns the neglectful treatment of Heather Winterstein and fully supports the call for an investigation into the Niagara Health System and Niagara EMS and a coroner's inquest. The St. Catharines Hospital falls under the Niagara Region Health Authority. Its CEO, Lynn Guerrero, sent APTN News a written statement that says... Our internal review identified some opportunities for improvement to help us provide the best possible care for everyone, particularly during times of overcapacity and health system pressures. We have met with, um, with uh, the CEO, uh, Lynn Guerrero, as well as uh, um, uh, other upper management and they've been very open about um, wanting to make change, which the family has greatly appreciated. Uh, In the meantime, Heather's, Heather's family awaits the results of the investigation from Ontario's Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, which um, Shimizu to, uh, expects a within a few weeks. Like so this Annette Francis, APTN National News, St. Catharines, Ontario. Her mother says that report was completed by the hospital, but they have been advised against sharing it by their lawyer. Well, an Indigenous delegation heading to meet Pope Francis on the 31st. The Assembly of First Nations held a virtual press conference on Thursday to announce who is going, what they hope the trip accomplishes. ABTN's Fraser Needham has more. Indigenous delegates were supposed to meet with Pope Francis last December, but that got cancelled due to Omicron. 
High on the agenda is to ask the Pope to come to Canada and apologize for residential schools run by the Catholic Church. But Delegation Lead Gerald Antoine says when this trip and possible apology will happen remains unknown. Certainly uh, our people have endured a lot of things and they have a sense of hope. Um, uh, they're optimistic about uh, how things will unfold in a good way and uh, this is one of the things that uh, we are very hopeful that uh, he would come to visit us. However, Antoine says a visit and papal apology won't be the only things on the menu. Immediate actions include returning the, the land properties uh, back to First Nations on whose traditional lands they are situated. Investment into long-term healing initiatives beyond the recent commitment of 30 million announced September 27, 2021 to ensure support programs and services for survival and their descendants. He says delegates will also be asking the Catholic Church to formally renounce the doctrine of discovery. A total of 32 indigenous delegates will be making the trip to Rome. This includes 13 from the AFN. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. A youth delegate from uh, Northeast British Columbia is going to be traveling to Vatican City as well with survivors and leaders to speak with Pope Francis. Our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs brings us this uh, to Fort Nelson, British Columbia for that story. Taylor Bain Tacoza is ready to share her truth and the truth of her nation a long way from her home in Fort Nelson, First Nation, British Columbia. And I still don't like that you're going to the house of ill repute. <laughs> I know. She's a delegate with the Assembly of First Nations, seeking an apology from Pope Francis in Rome this month. Hope something good comes out of it. My brother, Greg, he's uh, in the back seat of the car. It was a little blue car. And then he's just crying out the window. And me, I'm crying outside because I want to go. <laughs> yeah, it was. Bain Tacoza is Dene, a youth representative attending the trip and an intergenerational survivor of residential school. And, you know, being raised by a single mom, all my grandparents, all my, sorry, all my aunties, uncles had a hand in raising us. So it was like, I, yeah, just seeing them struggle every single day to, you know, be proud of who they are, where they come from. Yeah, it's, it's hard. So here's the Bain family, which is my mom's um, brothers and sisters. Yeah. She lives with the effects of residential school every day. I think for myself, it's like, you know, I, I can't speak my language. And that's one thing I really wish I could. You know, I, I do, I am fortunate to have the teachings passed down from my grandparents, but there's a lot that, that wasn't shared with me just because, you know, my, my grandparents are were terrified that, you know, what if, like, the church was going to come back or the RCMP was going to come back to, to get us. So it was always, like, it was always just a balance of, you know, what they could share. Leaving for Lower Post was exciting because all of my brothers and sisters had gone in previous years, and I was happy to finally to be able to go with them. When I got there, it wasn't what I had, what I had ex expected. It was late at night, and we were led into a meeting room with long tables and chairs. On June 21st, 2021, Lower Post Residential School came crashing down in a ceremonial demolition. You know, just hearing their stories of like how, you know, the times that they first walked in there to the time that they're standing there watching it being demolished was, you, you, could, you could feel the, the healing in their voice and, and hear it. And so I think that you know, th these are the steps, that's just one step we're taking in reconciliation and this trip to the Vatican is another. Bain Tacoza says she'll blend her family's story and advocate for youth involvement in healing processes. I'm hopeful that we are going to hear the words, I'm sorry, from Pope Francis come next week. And if we don't hear it, you know, we're not going to stop until we do. And so, um, I, yeah, again, I'm just, I think once he hears from, you know, the three of us, the Métis, the Inuit, and the First Nations, that he's going he's gonna to be compelled to say those exact words. An apology she hopes for her family, her nation, and Indigenous people across the globe to hear. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Fort Nelson, First Nation. 
The Métis National Council is sending a delegation to it. it will consist of survivors, elders, youth and community members, as well as their family members. Delegates will share their difficult stories from the past and hopes for the future relationship between the Métis Nation and the Catholic Church. They hope that part of that includes financial support for community-led healing and community rebuilding initiatives. Well, we need to take a break, but still ahead, an app that's helping sexually exploited people in Saskatoon. Welcome back. Sexually exploited young people in Saskatoon have a new tool to keep them safe with the I'm Not For Sale app created by the youth outreach organization EGADS. The organization says it will be a game changer in how they help kids on the street. APTN's Leanne Sanders reports. Approved app, which now has features like a Help Me Now button and a violent customers list that shows who kids on the street should watch out for. Executive Director Don Meikle says it should help kids avoid violent predators who've evolved and used technology to their advantage. These perverts go to these chat rooms, um, they make the deal over the chat line, um, they go and pick the, the young person up at wherever their location is, um, you know, these, these kids are being exploited and then dropped off at home. Um, so they're really getting hard to reach out to where they are. Meikle says the original app hasn't worked properly for about the last two years. This time, several young people who use EGAD services helped design the new features alongside the developer Push Interactions and thought of things adults may not have. I think there was eight or nine kids that, that throughout this whole process of the, the redesign of this app, you know, looked at such things as even colors, how important a color on your phone doesn't draw the attention of the people, you know, that might be sitting beside you at a party or sitting beside you in a vehicle. Kids anywhere in the province can download and use the I Am Not For Sale app, which is free to download on both Apple and Android phones. Mikkel says right now in Saskatoon alone, there are six young teenagers selling their bodies. He hopes the app will help those kids and others and show them there are people who do care. Prior to the old app crashing and stuff, we were getting an average of seven to 900 hits a month. Um, now with this new improved app, I think we're gonna, it's gonna be a lot more than that. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Saskatoon. A recent decision by the Supreme Court of Canada gives the Beaver Lake Cree Nation a chance to ask for advance funding for their litigation against the Alberta and Canadian governments Chris Stewart explains how that could have a big impact. The Beaver Lake Cree Nation has been fighting the Alberta and federal governments in court since 2008. They say overdevelopment on their traditional lands has hurt their way of life. Hunting and gathering have been severely impacted. Court documents show they have paid $3 million of an expected cost of $5 million, and they have no more funds to use to continue the fight. They asked the courts for advance funding to continue. The Alberta Court of Appeal denied their application. However, last Friday, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the community should be able to spend money on pressing needs like housing, social services, and infrastructure, and still be eligible for advance funding. They have been sent back to the Alberta courts to show it cannot afford both pressing needs and litigation. Andra Azevedo is a lawyer with EcoJustice, an environmental law charity and an intervener in the case, and says the Supreme Court decision could have wide implications. This case sets a precedent for First Nation governments who are bringing cases because the Supreme Court of Canada importantly confirms that when courts assess whether Indigenous governments can afford to bring litigation, that courts should consider the Indigenous government's pressing needs like housing, infrastructure, social programming, beyond just what has been char characterized as the bare necessities of life. Azevedo says the decision could also help individuals as well as Indigenous governments in getting advance funding in some situations. This is also a win for anyone bringing uh, publicly interested, uh, publicly important cases more broadly, um, because although the court was very importantly focused on uh, First Nation governments and and how this test applies to them, 
by emphasizing the importance of context and the circumstances of people who are bringing publicly important cases, um, this helps enhance access to justice more broadly because it means that courts should probably be looking at the context of anyone uh, bringing a publicly important case. Azevedo says the Supreme Court decision means that not having enough money shouldn't be a barrier for people with litigation that could affect many people. This ruling helps those people who have been uh, historically shut out of the justice system to continue to bring claims in the public interest um, and helps recognize the importance of people who might have limited financial means to continue to bring publicly important cases that end up really benefiting everyone. Beaver Lake Cree Nation will now argue in an Alberta court that it can't afford both pressing community needs and litigation at the same time. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Certainly an interesting development there. Well, during her bail hearing, Tamara Leach, an organizer of the Freedom Protest in Ottawa, claimed that she's Métis. Since then, there have been many questions around her Indigenous heritage. Now she's set the record straight with proof. Here's Tamara Pimentel with that story. When Tamara Leach claimed Métis ancestry, many questioned her. As a woman with Métis heritage? It prompted two genealogists to look into her background, and they couldn't find any Métis family members. And that blew up on social media. But it turns out that this genealogy is based off of Leach's adoptive family. Now APTN has obtained a copy of Leach's Métis Nation of Alberta card and certificate from January 2019, proving that she does have a Métis background. Leach's lawyer requested APTN doesn't show the copy of her card in our broadcast. The reason her Métis claims caught so much attention if the court accepts that Leach is Indigenous, she could be entitled to a Gladue report, which details her life and could be used by a justice at sentencing. In an affidavit, Leach stated that she was born in Saskatoon, adopted by a Caucasian family, and her biological maternal grandmother was Cree and biological maternal grandfather was Métis. Leach was granted bail on March 7th. She's facing multiple criminal charges, including mischief. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. They are using APTN has seen Leach's Alberta Métis card that proves her indigeneity. In an email, her lawyer told us, if convicted of any of the charges, they will seek a Gladue report. Also, late this week, it was announced that Leach faces new charges of mischief and intimidation stemming from her involvement in the Ottawa convoy protests. She's scheduled to appear in court again in April. Well, the warning signs are all there. Interest rates are going up, cost of fuel is going up, and the overall cost of living will climb this year. Nunavut is already Canada's most food insecure region. Simply put, a higher percentage of people go hungry in Nunavut than in the rest of the country. Our Kent Driscoll stopped by the Iqaluit Food Centre to see how they're preparing for inflation's hammer. Here at the Kajuktervik Food Centre in Iqaluit, they teach cooking lessons. They help people advocate for themselves through government red tape, and they run a Kaluit soup kitchen. The demand is huge. In October, we saw demand skyrocket. Um, this was at a time when here in Kaluit, we had a water crisis ongoing where we saw demand explode as people were unable to cook with clean water in their homes. Um, but it was also the coincided with the end of um, a lot of the income programs that were available throughout the pandemic for community members. They went from serving under 100 people a day when COVID benefits were in place to upwards of 250 people a day when those benefits ended. Now, with an expected increase in cost of living this year, that could get even higher. Right side, the previous crisis could help fund this one. One thing that was a silver lining of the water crisis is that we received a lot of donations from people and foundations from across the country. Uh, so the last year has seen a significant increase in the amount of donations that we usually see that we are now looking to possibly use to offset our food costs. The biggest cost for food is shipping it to Nunavut. But there's lots of food in Nunavut. You just have to know how to hunt it. Looking local is another possible solution, one they're trying already here at the food centre. That's about to get more expensive too. 
as gas prices are going up and equipment and ammunition and everything that goes into hunting, as those prices also continue to rise, it means that we need to pay hunters more to ensure that they are also making a living income off of hunting. 60% of Nunavut households have a food insecure adult, someone that doesn't have enough to eat. 40% of homes in Nunavut have a child in the same hungry situation. A higher cost of living will hit Nunavut hard because the status quo hits pretty hard already. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. Thanks for that, Kent. Well, it's time for another break, but still ahead, a sure sign of spring. Stay with us. video of two women in the United States hitting the slopes in their traditional regalia has gone viral on social media, but it's also raised the question as to why there aren't more Indigenous people and people of colour as often seen at ski resorts. Tamara Pimentel has that story. It isn't a sight you often see at a ski resort. Maria Hawkins is a Chippewa Cree woman from Bozeman, Montana. She got the idea of snowboarding in her ribbon skirt from Divya Maya who went viral skiing in her traditional sari. I wanted to represent for all the Indigenous peoples of Montana, especially the children, because when I was a child learning how to snowboard, you don't see people that look like you. You don't see people of color out there. Maya lives in Minneapolis, but is originally from India. After connecting on social media, the women met up at the Bridger Bowl Ski Resort in Montana to sport their regalia together, bringing awareness to the lack of Black, Indigenous and people of colour on the slopes. Hawkins says it's all about the cost. The lift passes, the rental packages for skis, um, I know that that could range anywhere up to $100 as well. So it's really just a uh, accessibility issue. I know we're just out there on the slopes and wearing our, you know, traditional outfit and trying to say that we're, you know, representing BIPOC, but what does it actually mean? How can we make it more accessible for more people of color to just go and try out these sports and actually excel in it? The women say there needs to be programs for people and children of color across North America that give them access to learning the sport. Because, you know, we need to see more really badass women on the slopes and um, showing that it's not just like a sport for white people. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Much respect to those ladies. That's, there's no way I'm putting slippery things on my feet and going down a mountain like that. Well, still on the slopes, uh, but now for a definite sign of spring. Boo the grizzly bear is seen emerging from his den for the 20th year in a row. The longtime resident of Kicking Horse Mountain Resort's Bear Refuge in Golden, B.C. was caught on camera poking through the snow. I also came out of hibernation last week. I went on a vacation in Cuba, but my honey and my kiddo were in Golden uh, right when Boo came out, so they got to see that. Well, that's a wrap for your weekend news. I'm Melissa Ridgen. I'll see you back here on Monday.